and social and maybe even Judaic maturity to understand the concept that we're going to speak about now, although it's not an easy one. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. I think that we, we're all in agreement that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to love each other. Hashem wants everyone to love each other in a very strong way. And we were really happy when we see that Ava manifest itself. I remember years ago I went to France and I was in the airport and it was one of those moving sidewalks where you just stand there and the you know, sidewalk moves and on one side there was sidewalk going one way and then right next to it was the sidewalk going the other way. And as we were there, it was my first time in France, I was, I was a lot younger than I am now, and as, as I'm passing by, as I'm on, this, on the sidewalk going one way, there is a Jewish-French family, black hat and all, going the other way. And as we passed each other, as we crossed paths, I turned and I said, Shalom Aleichem. And he said, Aleichem Shalom, in that French accent. And we smiled and there was a, you know, the sidewalk kept going and, you know, made a distance between us. But my heart was filled with love and pride. And look, look at this. Here we are. We've never met each other. We'll probably never meet each other again. But we share the same Zaydas and Babas. We share the same, the same heritage and the same values and the same love for Hashem and all that together makes us want to say hello when we pass each other in France. And we've heard about this, we probably haven't heard about it enough, um, but we've heard about it. And when I say we, I don't think we've heard about it enough, it's because if we would understand how pivotal having love towards a fellow Jew really is, it would be a priority. It would be something that is spoken about every other speech that you hear. And you hear a lot of very, very chash v'shmuzin. You hear shmuz about uh, tzniyus, I'm sure more than one. You've heard tzniyus, I'm sorry, thank you. Thanks. You've heard shmuzin about the internet. You've heard shmuzin. Lots of different things, and you've heard about the evils of this, and the evils of that, and the dangers of this, and the dangers of that. But to hear a talk about, let's work on this, Avas Yisrael, again and again and again, until, until, it, it, until it, we're in anguish when we hear that in Tinek on Moitzah Shabbos, a tree falls down and two people die. We... What do we do the rest of the night, immediately after we heard that news? What do we do? Think about what we did. We may have given a krechts, we may have said, I think, and then, you know, what, what were we doing from our market tonight? Are we going ice skating? Are we, what are we doing? We should have been ice match. We should have been completely out of our, out of our heads. We should have been distraught. But the reason we're not, is not because we don't feel tragedy, but really, I believe it's because we don't feel love. We don't feel the kind of love that we should because we, we don't hear about it enough. We're going to speak about one of those kinds of love, possibly the most difficult of those kinds of love. But I, I throw this out to you because I, I think it's something that has to be spoken about more and more. HaKadosh um, Baruch Hu, when he said, do you want to accept my Torah? So Klai Yisrael, it says, they stood in front of the mountain, they stood in front of our Sinai, and we all know the words, we all know the song, we all know the Rashi. And that was not just a side note, that was the prerequisite to the Jewish people accepting the Torah. They had to, sit, they had to stand by the mountain like one person. If they had been like two people, or ten people, or whatever, whatever it is, then Hashem would have said, you know what? I cannot give you the Torah. You have to be Kishach HaBalei Vachad. Now, if you stop and think about it a moment, what does that mean, Kishach HaBalei Vachad? They all stood around the mountain and they were able to see each other experience Kabbalah Satorah. 
The only thing is, if you think about it, the way we look at the Jewish people standing around the mountain is that they weren't in one area of the mountain, they weren't on the north of the mountain, or the south, or the east, or the west. They were around the mountain. And when you're around the mountain, what that really means is that the people on the north side of Har Sinai did not see the people on the south side of Har Sinai. And the people on the east didn't see the people on the west. So how could it have been ki ish echad v'leiv echad? How, how was it? I, I didn't even see half the people there. The answer is that they were at one with each other. The ava that they had towards each other transcended the idea that, okay, I don't see you, but I know that you're there. We have this amazing idea when uh, the Jewish people crossed the Amser. It says when they crossed the Amser, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I'm going to make a different row for each of my, for each of my shvatim. In other words, you each have a purpose. But even though you each have a purpose, you're going to be able to see each other. It was see-through. Right? Reuven was able to see, Shemir was able to see Levi, and so on. Why, would it, why was it see-through? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, even though you're different, and even though you may have different minhagim, but you see, you have to see each other, you have to care about each other. Even more, if you look at the Medrash, the Medrash says that when Shevet Dun went through the Yamsuf, when Shevet Dun went through, they brought with them Avodah Zarah. That means they walked through the Yam holding idols. Now you stop and think about it like, Fellas, Hashem is making an ace for you. Why not, why not leave the Avodah on the other side of the Yam? Why bring it with you through the Yam? As a matter of fact, on that the Medrash says, the Malachim said, Halalu oiv de Avodah Zarah, v'halalu oiv de Avodah Zarah. These people worship and these people worship Avodah Zarah. Why should you save the Yidden? And why should you kill the Gaim? Why should you kill the Mitzrayim? So the question is like this. Did Hashem make the walls that were in between Sheva Dun and the Sheva to the right and the Sheva to the left, did He make those walls see through as well? There's a technical question. Yeah. Were they able? Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. Meaning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, even though they're holding Avoy Dazara, I want you to be able to see them because they are still your brothers and sisters. You still have to have that love. Maybe you'll be mushpi on them. I'm not worried you're going to be mushpa from them. But you have to see them. You have to see them. You have to feel with your heart who they are, what they're about. And, and that is, that's the idea of loving, uh, loving your fellow Jew. Now, when I was 18 years old, I went to Eretz Israel, And I went, I went, um, I went to a kolol over there. And the, it was one of my first Shabbos, and, and I was staying by the Mashkiach's house, and I was waxing poetic. I was telling this Mashkiach, you know, when I see these Israeli kids, you know, they can be completely non from My heart is filled with love. I just want to take him in, a little cute little Israeli kid. You don't want to hug him and kiss him. You're my brother. You're my right. You're mine. You're, we're one. We're one nation. I mean, I wish you kept chatting, I wish you kept pushing, but we're one. So the Mashkiach said to me, ah, that's not a big deal. The fact that you want to hug the cute little Israeli kid, that's not a big deal. I want you to go to Meir Sha'arim and look at the old little Rev Arla kid with the pom-pom white yarmulke and the, and the curly payas and the white socks pulling up. You feel like hugging him as well? Oh, not so much, <laughs> yeah. And that's the first time I was exposed to what we're going to speak about this evening. Which is, how do you love somebody who looks at you as if you are less from than them? This is a tough one. It's easy to love the Balchuva. It's easy to love the person who you look at us less than you, he's a nebuch, I'll introduce him to Shabbos, I'll get him to Kai, I'll get him to, to keep kosher, that's going to be wonderful. The question is, how do you love the guy, 
How do you love the lady who you think looks down on you because you're not as firm as that? Does that question resonate with you? It's a tough one. I want to tell you that Rabbi Akiva said, when I see a gadol, when I see a tzaddik, when I see a Talmud Chacham walking by, he said this before he became Rabbi Akiva, when I see a person of Torah knowledge walking by, I feel like kicking them in the teeth. I want to knock their teeth out. Because nobody likes to get looked down on. We don't like when someone looks down on us. And when I go into a Hasidic Shashtibel, and here I am, and I'm not Hasidic very clearly, and in my mind I begin to think, do they look down on me? Do they look at me like I'm not really from or I'm modern or a little off the derech? Maybe, probably. But do I love them still? Do I have Avas Yisrael? I'm not worried about whether they have Avas Yisrael to me. <laughs> Hopefully they do. But do I have it to them? This is a tough, tough issue. It is the toughest, it, it, it's the toughest issue to love somebody who you, look, you think looks down on you. So I want to tell you an amazing story that I was privileged to be part of. And this story is going to be published in a book that is coming out right after Pesach. But I'm going to give you all the details. The story, uh, I take a little shortcut in the book. This is the long version of the story. I knew a fellow. He was a Talmud Chacham, knew how to learn, went to a very, very good yeshiva, got married to a Choshiva woman, the daughter of a Rav. He had his own yeshiva, and his father, who was a Rav, eventually passed away. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was summoned by the community that his father was the Robin to go and be the next Rav of the community. And he agreed, he accepted, and he left that yeshiva to take over the shul, to take over the community. And he was a good Rav, very eloquent, an amazing speaker. I was in awe to, to listen, listen to him and give it to Russia. built the community, created actors in the community, made programs in the community. And the community, it was an out-of-town community, began to grow. Now there's a certain reality which is that as communities begin to grow, and you want to create a from community with a fromer element, and you start sending the kids or the kids of your Balabatim to yeshiva, they come back, and guess what? They're too from for the shul that they grew up in. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Eventually they say, we have to make a firmer shul. We gotta make a uh, firmer shul, a more yeshiva shul. And that's what happened in this community. They decided, a number of balabatim became firmer, they decided that the shul of this rub is not firm enough for them, so they hired a very yeshiva shul and he moved in, and created the Yeshiva Shishul. Of course, if that is now the Yeshiva Shishul, what's the other Shul? It's the modern Shul, the Balapata Shishul. And who wants to be associated with that? Not the people who want to be from her. So people began to leave that Shul that was once the big community Shul to go to the new breakaway Shul, the From Shul. You must have heard stories like this in the past. This is what happens. Then it's not a bad thing. If it's done in a derech hair, it's thick away. Because eventually shuls grow. Maybe Bar Parker Flatbush also started with one shul once upon a time. Right? It happened starting with the first one. And then another one opened up. And then a breakaway. And this, that, and Chastin, Shulitzvish, and Sorority, whatever it is. That's how communities grow. But this Rav, who had put his heart and soul into the shul, was understandably upset. He felt, as do many rabbanim of shuls that, uh, that spawn breakaways, he felt the shul was not big enough to have a breakaway pilfer all sorts of from uh, the from element from the shul. And more than that, he said, 
I worked so hard to make my shul a firm shul, and now you're going to come and you're going to bring all sorts of, you're going to, you're going to make another shul, you're going to have, it's going to be the firmer shul, so now they're going to take away all my yeshiva light, and I'm back to square one, trying to make it a yeshiva shul. And now every time I make someone yeshiva shul, what's, what's going to happen? It'll go to the firm shul. And, uh, and it, it's sad, but that's, that's just what happens. The, the rub did get very upset. And after a little while, he had enough. And he resigned from that shul. And he stopped being a rav. And as he, uh, he went into business, and he became, whatever, semi-successful. And, uh, and that was it. He would dominate in that first shul. But he was very bitter. And at every opportunity, he would put down yeshiva light. He would put down B'nai Torah, even though he himself used to be a Rosh Hashiva, but now the bitterness uh, pervaded uh, his home. It seeped into every one of his bones, and uh, it became the talk of his Shabbos table. Whenever he would see something, he'd read a story in the paper. He was the first one to say, ah, you see these guys, you see these guys. And it was very sad, because he did have a lot of kids, and the kids... You know, your tati, daddy, abba, speak like that again and again. And you grow up like that. What's going to happen? What's going to be your outlook in life? You're also going to have an axe to grind. You're also going to feel, this is, these are yeshiva life. Well, this rub, one of his sons, was getting married. And he's getting married to a girl. And that girl lived in, uh, the girl lived in New York. And therefore, the wedding was going to be in New York. We heard about this, so we called this Rav. We were friendly with him. We knew him from before. We said, you know what? Why don't you come to New York? You'll be our guest. We'd love to have you. Be our guest. Come, bring the family. During the week of Shevard Brachas, whatever Shevard Brachas are in New York, we'll even make a Shevard Brachas for you. And the Rav, this former Rav turned businessman, was grateful and he agreed. And he came from out of town, he came to our home, and he stayed by us. The day before the wedding, I decided to take this uh, former Rav and his Robinson out to eat. We live in Muncie, so I took him to the Purple Pear. And we began to schmooze, and as we're schmoozing, in walks a few Hasidim into the Purple Pear. And they see uh, they see this former Rav, the Rav sees them, and he turns to me and he says, you know, they don't really care about other Jews. It's all a charade. The beard and the black cap and this and the payas. They care about themselves and themselves alone. They don't really care about other people. So I said, you know, I don't agree with you. He goes, no, you wouldn't. You live in Muncie. No, I don't agree with you. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I said, a little while ago, I was actually called by a Hasidic Shafelo to give a shir to a group of Satmar Hasidim how to do Kiruv. Now, when you think about Kiruv, the first thing that comes to mind is not always a Satmar Hasid doing the Kiruv. And what, 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 what is he going to do? He doesn't speak English. Is he going to go over to someone on a subway? You know? A girl? <laughs> Not gonna happen, right? So I was surprised, but I said, "Sure, you want? I'll be glad to give a shir in Hanukkah Kiruv." And I, I uh, went down to the Satmar Kolel, and I was surprised. The room was full. I gave a shir, and the shir kept going and going. And they were asking questions, and they wanted to know. And one hour turned into two hours, which turned into three hours. And these chassidim are going at it. What do I do if he says this? What do I do if then? How do I invite for Shabbos? And how do I act? And, like, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, this is a little bit of a waste of time because I'm never really going to do it. <laughs> but it's still sort of cool that they want to do Kiruv. So I told this former Rav, I said, you know, if they didn't care about other Jews, they would not have called me down to teach them how to do Kiruv. 
Eh, it's just a show, it's a charade, it's not real, don't be so naive, don't be so gullible. Okay, what am I going to argue with this guy? I'm not going to argue with him. Okay, let's enjoy our fried fish and chips. And there we go. So we finished eating, we went home. The next day was the wedding. Very excited, the wedding. Now, I had a little bit of a dilemma because there was another friend of mine who was getting married that evening, and he did not have any family. He was a Baal Shuva, any, any from family. And I felt that I, I should be there for the chuppah. And this friend of mine, he'll have tons of people at the wedding. He's, he was a rub, his, his, his wife is a daughter of a very famous rub. They'll have tons of people. And this other wedding is going to have no one. It would be a mitzvah for me to start off that wedding, show face, make a lot of dick in the beginning. And then I'll go over, I may miss the chuppah of this former rub's son, but you know, I'll go to a mitzvah wedding. So I went to the mitzvah wedding, which was in Muncie. And then I was going to drive over to Williamsburg, where this wedding was taking place, which is where the hall was. So I'm in the middle of the first mitzvah wedding when I get an SOS phone call, emergency phone call. I pick up the phone, and the person on the other line said, you have to, you have to come to this wedding. I said, why? Well, this friend of yours who stayed at your house, the wedding is here in Williamsburg. It is set for 350 people, and... 20 people have showed up to the wedding. 20 people, men and women included. So 20 people, he said, there is screaming, there is yelling, there is crying, there are many, many, many empty tables, there's a five-piece band and a singer, and 20 people, your worst nightmare. Imagine you make a wedding and 20 people have showed up. So I said, okay, I'm in the car, I get, I, I'm on the way to Williamsburg. And okay, what are you going to do about it? Bring some friends. And I'm like, oh, bring some friends. You have 20 people, what am I going to do? Pack my car with three more people? <laughs> so we have 23 people then, 24 including myself. What am I going to do? What, what, what are we supposed to do? So I'm driving, I'm thinking this is just a, a disaster. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but I, what, what are we going to do? So I'm driving to the wedding, I'm driving, and I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? Then, I thought to myself, one second, there's a group of Samra Hasidim <laughs> <laughs> that I gave the class to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send a text, well, I'm driving, maybe, you know, that was before it was illegal. <laughs> I'm going to send a text, and I'm going to tell the, the guy who arranged it to try to get a few of the guys, if they live in Williamsburg, let them walk on over and give Mazel Tov. It shouldn't be an embarrassment. So I, so I had time and drive for one text for SOS, mitzvah, kasana, at such and such a hall. Please make sure people come. So the guy calls me up. He says, what's the deal? I said, mitzvah, 20 people showed up. Can you get a few cover? He says, I'll do my best. Get to the wedding. I miss the chuppah. The sight. You've never seen a, such a sight at a wedding. It was like a veilus. At the chuppah, if anyone was male, they got a kibbutz. <laughs> Even the 13-year-old kids. Because they, they, they barely had a minion there. And this is a fancy hall, and very posh. Shalom Simcha was a singer in the Gino Orchestra. Nobody, nobody showed him. So I come in, I give Mazda. All the men were at one table. They didn't want to scan it. Can you imagine if everyone actually, <laughs> actually sat at their designated table? On there. One over there. So, they're all sitting around one table. I come in and give them mazel tov. So what happened? What happened? I'm beginning to poke around. What happened? What happened was, they had decided not to insert reply cards. They would send out an invitation. You know, because they figured that they basically know how many people are going to show up and supply. Reply cards, people don't reply. They do and they're not coming anyways. Not worth it. The the wife. Oh, okay. the, what had happened was the wife had asked the husband to mail the invitations and had left them in his office, and he didn't realize that. And so, no invitations were sent to the wedding. 
and therefore no one knew there was a wedding that night. Is that sad? The one, no one got an invitation. So here I am, I'm in Williamsburg, no one is showing up to this wedding. And then, okay, they finish the first course, and the dancing begins. The dancing begins. And now, lady and gentlemen, <laughs> for the very first time, blah, 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 and this small group of seven guys, we're, we're trying, we're trying, because some of the people, older people are just sitting, like, how dare you sit when there are seven people dancing? And we're, and we're dancing, and a few minutes after we begin, in walks in, three chassidim. Okay, they walk in, right away, without missing a beat, they take a hand, they begin to dance. Two minutes later, four more chassidim walk in. Okay, circles, circumference is going. A <laughs> few minutes later, ten chassidim walk in, ten more, then three, then eight, and 13, 9, 12, and it's a mom, it's a mom. People begin to come, and the circle's growing. And now there's enough room for a circle within a circle. So, <laughs> wow, two circles. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the, in the women's section, people are beginning to come. Girls, seminary girls, they're packing in. Five, ten, another seven, another three. And the is beginning to fill up. It was remarkable. Well, the first dance is going strong, 15 minutes into the day, if you look around, 50 people, 70 people, 100 people, and it kept growing. By the time we finished the first amazing dance, there were well over 200 people at this wedding. And when the dance finished, the chassidim picked up the chassidim, just as if it was their own brother and best friend, and they danced with him afterwards. And then they put him on the dais, they put him there next to the kala. The mother of the chasm comes running over to me, tell them they can stay and eat. <laughs> tell them they can eat. All this chicken, what am I going to do with 300, 300 portions? So I said to them, okay, you know what they said? I really thought they were going to come over and give them, show them a little mazel tov, you know, a little thing, say hello, two minutes dance. No, they all stayed. They said they had a little something to eat. And I'm looking at the face of this father. This person who summed everything up, who summed Hasidim up in a nutshell, that they are selfish people, uncaring people. And I'm wondering, next move, your move. Well, he did have a next move. Something I was not expecting. We're in the middle of eating, you know, the soft music is playing. He gets up and he says, Thank you so much for coming. I would now like to ask my daughter to say a few words. And his 20-year-old daughter gets up in Williamsburg in front of 200 Sabra Hasidim <laughs> to deliver a Dvar Torah. I think, no, you didn't just do that. You know, I figure, okay, here comes the fire alarm to the exit. Here comes the stampede to the to my amazement and to their credit. They put their heads down, this is Williamsburg, you know, they're not gonna look at a lady that I, they did not leave, they stayed and they listened. When she finished, when they finished the course, the second dance began. When the second dance began, more chassidim came. More and more. And by the time the second dance was reaching a climax, 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes into the dance, there was a circle, within a circle, within a circle, within a circle. And there in the middle sat the chassan and his father. And the father did not know what hit him. These chassan didn't just come to dance. They brought shtick. <laughs> yes, they, the women and the men. And they brought costumes and they brought fire and they were juggling. I am telling you, it was the most love of the chassan I had ever, ever been to. It was so amazing. Four different seminaries were called from my one text message. Four seminaries in Williamsburg were called. Send your girls, there's a yid in need. And they stopped what they were doing. And the man, they left their learning to come and be Masana Chasim Vakala. 
and we're near the end of this second dance, and I'm thinking, whoever needs a shirak dava now, whoever needs children dava now, because the oitzer hatoiv and shamayim must be so wide open. I meant that you, you can feel, you can feel that oitzer hatoiv, you can feel the hashba. Hashem said, look at my kindleach, look, look how much they care. And it's near the very last dance. And there's one chassid, who was more Lebedic, who was more lively than any of the other Hasidim who were there, and he's dancing through the circle from one circle to the next, he suddenly goes over to the Hasid and his father who's sitting there in the middle, and he takes off his shrimal, and he takes it, and he puts it on the Hasid's <laughs> head. <laughs> and the father takes one look, and he looks at his son with the shrimal on his head, he looks at the Hasid back, forth, and this look of recognition comes over his face. Ah, that's what it, this is all about. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to convert my son. That's why they all came in droves. They want to convert him. So the father takes the strimal off of his son's head and right away thrusts it back at the chassim. At the chassim. Here, take this. No, thank you. The son looks at his father and looks at the chassid. And he looks back at his father and looks back at the hidden who are dancing and singing. He takes one more look at his father's bitter, angry face. And he takes the strimal back from the chassid, puts it back on, back on his head, and he begins to dance in the middle, more levitic than anyone else, with his hands waved high in the air as if to embrace every single person in the room. And that love for the person who you thought that he thought that he's better than you transcended time and space. Did the father learn his lesson? I can't say he did. Did the son, did the family learn? I would certainly hope that they did. But did Klal Yisrael learn a lesson? Did you just learn a lesson? You had to have. You see, it's really tough when we look at people who we think, think that they are firmer than us. We so much want to be Oiv Dei Hashem. We want to connect. Sometimes we even think we are connecting. Until we stand in front of a person who not only thinks that they know the real way to connect, but knows that the way that we are connecting is not the way to connect. How dare you have long hair? How dare you wear the jeans for an hour? How dare you wear this? How dare you? Right? You, you're, you're, you're lower. Maybe I can do cure of on you. <laughs> <laughs> you're the Baal Chuba in the story. <laughs> you're, the, you're, the cure. you're the one who needs cure. How do you love a person like that? What's the trick to Avas Yisrael like that? So I'm going to tell you a few different eights, a few different pieces of advice. How to love the Jew who you think that they think that they're better than you. The first thing that you must know is as follows. If you think that people are looking at you and judging you, you very well may be wrong. Now, I'm going to explain to you what I mean. On one level, we all judge each other. We all do. That's the way Hashem made us. We look at the next person and we sum them up. And anyone who doesn't sum up their surroundings is oblivious. <laughs> I know that. That's, I, that's not the judging that I'm speaking about, right? You, you're looking at me. You, you, right when I walk in, if you, maybe you know me, maybe you don't. Is he a rabbi? You don't look like a rabbi. He doesn't have a beard. <laughs> He's got a chub. He is short. Okay, maybe you can rabbi like Rabbi Wallerstein. He also doesn't have a beard. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know if I'm mind reading. I don't, you know, that's okay. That's okay. We look at each other. That's not the judging that I'm speaking about. <laughs> right? That's not what the judgment I'm speaking about. Oh, maybe he's got a chub because of Kiru. <laughs> okay, that's okay then. <laughs> Maybe his wife likes. Maybe he grew up out of town. <laughs> right? That's who we are. Just... When I'm speaking about judging, I'm speaking about judging and reacting in that judgment. That's what I'm speaking about. And I don't think that people go around with that kind of judgment. 
I did grow up out of town, yes. I do have a chip for Kiruv in case you're wondering. I'm on campus usually. Tomorrow I'll be at BU, which is called Boston University. Um, and um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, which does not have many chassidim. When I grew up, there, were, there was one chassid. One. Can you imagine being the one chassid in Cleveland? <laughs> oh, you mean the chassidish? Chassidish guy. The one chassidish guy. Um, and he wasn't even really chassidish. <laughs> he just compared to us, he was chassidish. <laughs> so, I, I moved to Borough Park. My wife is from Borough Park. And I had a sister who was coming to visit us in Borough Park. So she said to me, you know, I don't really know what to wear in Borough Park. I say, whatever you wear, you wear in Borough Park. What's the... She goes, no, like, there's a way to dress in Borough Park. I'm dressed Borough Park. <laughs> I said, no, there's really no way to dress. Me. You just be whoever you are. She goes, no, they're all going to look at me. I said, my name is Khan. I said, Khana, come, no, they'll look at you, don't worry. Okay, I convinced her. She comes to Borough Park. And I said, you got to see 13th Avenue, you've never been there, you're going to love it. We're walking up 13th Avenue, and she's clearly, visibly uncomfortable. So if I said, what's the matter? She goes, they're all looking at me. <laughs> they're looking at me, they're judging me. I said, Chana, you're nuts. You really are. <laughs> Nobody's looking at you. Right? You think they're looking at you? They, they don't even know you exist. They are taking care of their kids. They're trying to pay the bills. They're running to the bank. They have to pick up milk. They have to prepare something before the husbands come. They are not looking. They're just trying to get from point A to point B. That's all that is going on. And that's how we looked at it. Like, everyone's got to be judging. No one's, no one's going around judging. And the moment we realize that that kind of judgment doesn't mean that nobody does it, but in general, that penetrating judgment that we fear, oh, they're not so from maybe I do. That's not quite the way it is. Now, yeah, you can be dressed in a really funky way and you're asking to be judged. Okay. But in general, that's how it is. I even tell that to my Bali Chuva when they end up going to a, uh, a house. I say, you know, you're going to think sometimes, oh, they're all judging me, I'm not so religious. I said, no, you are who you are, they know who you are. No one's going around. Okay, let's see, let's see. They got to this, you know, he knows how to say shalom. He says Shabbos, not Shabbat. So probably he grew conservative or conservative right? He knows Osa Shalom, but he also knows this, this song. Okay, he's sort of in between. Okay, let's see if we can get him to be shalom again. <laughs> they're not looking, they're not judging. So number one, we have to get a little bit over ourselves. In order to be judged, we have to be somebody, you know. We're not just somebody that everyone's going around judging, right? People judge presidents, people judge big personalities. Us, we're just who we are. You know, we just walk around, we do what we do. That's number one. Number two, a person has to realize that everyone is at heart really very much the same. You know, there's a drush on the words, the ahafta l'recha kamocha. You should love your friend like yourself. Another way of reading that is, the Ahav, the Lerecha, you should love your friend. You know why? Because they are Kamocha. They're just like you. You think, oh, they're completely different. I mean, they, they grew up in Flappers, I grew up in Bar Park. They're like, I have no shaykhs to them. <laughs> they're Kamocha. They really are. We have the, the, the same things make us happy, and the same things make us sad. There was a beautiful A.B. Rottenberg tune about people who, are, who have uh, mental retardation and he, he sings, uh, he sings uh, it's called We Are Not So Different, I don't know if you've heard it, it's a beautiful song. Now, that's true about people who are really severely mentally handicapped and if we share so much in common with them, so how much more so that we have shared in common with somebody who's really just like us, but they have bigger face or a shorter shape or longer hair or a longer skirt or blacker tights or white and Right, black socks type, whatever it is, we're really very much the same. I mean, this can be taken to an extreme. There was a documentary that once came out that dealt with Israelis and Palestinians. And the idea of the documentary to show they're really not that much different. And what they did was they took uh, some kids that were Israeli and some kids were secular Israeli kids and some Palestinian kids and they did a project with them together and they laughed together and they cried together and they had victories together. And the idea of the 
of the documentary was, you see, they're really not that different. Now, us Jews would say, of course, we know we're not that much different, they just want to kill us, but otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise we know we're not, you know. But, but uh, sort of a simplistic view of the world is, they're not that much different, so love them. You know? mm. But the idea that we're not that much different is a, a very profound idea. So when we think somebody looks at themselves like they're firmer than us, just remember, you know, they're not that much different. For each person who thinks that they are firmer than you, there's someone who thinks they're firmer than them. There's always like the big fish, little fish, right? And you look like you're firmer than one or another person, and the conservative guy thinks he's firmer than the reform, and the reform thinks he's uh, more than the reconstructionist, and he's more firmer than the atheist, and the atheist couldn't give a darn anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's how it is, we're all like that. Okay, another idea. A person must be confident about their Yiddishkeit. And really, out of all the answers that I give you tonight, this is the most valid and the most sure. A person has to feel confident that the, the way in Judaism that they've chosen is the right way. And that doesn't mean it's the only right way, and it doesn't mean that they're doing anything wrong if they practice differently necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that Right? It could be. They sing, they dance, they wear a strimal, they wear a snoo, they wear a shakel, they wear this, they that. But if you know, based on your teachers, based on your rabbeim, based on the hadracha that you have, that you are going in the derech hanacham, the derech hayashar, so who cares? Who really, really cares? It's, it's a very, very important idea. We have to have a little bit of pride in how we are growing up. You know, I, I do Kiruv. And I love doing it. And I, Baruch Hashem, I've been my shpia on many people. So, when I needed to overcome, Baruch Hashem, I live in Muncie long ago. I don't, have, I don't need this. When I needed to overcome, when I first came to Muncie, I'd go to a Satmar, Steve, I'd go to a Vishnitz, and... If I'd say, oh, they're looking at me, and I got this, and they look again, I would say, yeah, but you know what? You know, I have a thousand people keeping shots because of me, what, what, what do you do? You know? <laughs> and like, but then, I caught myself, like, because what am I doing? I'm trying to one-up them. Like, you're looking down at me? Well, I'll look down at you. No, that doesn't work either. As a matter of fact, uh, and this is, this is the last eights I want to give you. If, you, if you do that, if you look down on them, for looking down on you, then you're really just like them. Mm -hmm. You are exactly what you don't like about people who you think are looking down on you. That make sense? Mm -hmm. So we have to be, we have to remain positive. If there's someone who wants to judge me, that, that's their prerogative. They're probably not. They're really very much the same. They're just trying to get from point A to point B. But if they must judge me, then that's their own handicap. But I will love them unconditionally and totally no matter what. Because I am a Mitzvah of love. And this is the last, the last idea. The moment you go negative, the moment you go negative in your mind, or even worse, the way you speak about other hidden is the moment you lose. It's a critical and difficult concept. The concept, again, is as follows. We are taught, when we're young, to differentiate between Tov and Ra, Emes and Shekhar, Mitzvah and Avera. A good Ashba versus a bad Ashba. And because we are taught in this sort of black and white idea, this black and white concept, then we end up saying, this is me and that's them. That's the balance. And I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and they're not. And not only are they not, but they're... They think they are. They think they got it right. And they're, 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 they're getting people off the derech because they have this malach or that malach. And their marriages aren't real marriages. And they probably would get a divorce if it wasn't such a stigma. You know? <laughs> and all, all the negative things that we think about, and then maybe sometimes we, we say, if you go negative, you lose. Always and forever. You want to be someone who people listen to? You have to stay positive. Even if you think negative, you still have to stay positive. I want to tell you a sort of a scary mindset. 
there was a, uh, I, 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 was doing, I was doing Kiruv at the UCLA campus, and we did, we did a trip to New York. We were in California. We went to New York on a 10 day trip. And the idea of the New York trip is to give them Shirim in the morning, and they experience it from Hasana in New York, and so on and so forth. It's a great experience, and many people end up becoming from, so usually later on down the road, but because of that New York trip. So there was one particular girl, her name was, was Carrie. And Carrie was on fire after the trip. She was like, oh yes, I'm going to do it and keep Shabbos and kosher and this and that. And uh, I was really proud of her. I had spent time speaking with her, being mechazaker. And then she came over to me one day and she said, Rabbi, I love Judaism so much. I just enrolled in the Jewish studies course for credits. And I think to myself, oh no you didn't. The Jewish studies course is given by an apikoros. Not just an apikoros, but a shana upiresh. Somebody who once was on the derech and now is off the derech, so he knows a little bit enough to make it sound like he knows enough to, uh, you can trust me, I've been there, done that. And she's going to take classes by him? This is a disaster. So I didn't know the no going negative rule yet. So I, I went there and I said, you know what? I, I would never take class by a guy like that. The guy's a buffoon. I still remember the word I used. He's a buffoon. <laughs> well, guess what? I never saw Carrie again. For the next two years. For two years, the last two years of her college, she was uh, beginning her third year in college, she, she wouldn't even come around. All I had to do was go negative, and that was it. Who wants to be around someone negative? Chaz de Hashem, the last semester, I happened to see her walking, and I said, oh, how are you? And she goes, oh, like, hi, Rabbi. I said, you know, we really need to sit and talk. And she agreed, and she was in a place in her life, her boyfriend just broke up, and he wasn't Jewish, and I said, let's go to Israel, whatever. Today she is a from lady living in uh, Hancock Park, which is a from neighborhood of LA, and she was my kid's teacher, and, and then <laughs> Yeshiva Day School, and, but uh, that, that, I almost blew it. I mean, I did blow it, two years down the drain, because I went negative. When you go negative, you lose. When I interview people for jobs, I listen to that. You go negative about your boss, you go negative, you're out of here. Who wants to be on someone who's negative? Even if you have good reasons to explain what your problem, I have a problem with Chabad, I got a problem with Bresla, I got a problem with this, I got... You explain that to someone who's not from, you know what they're going to hear? You're Mr. Negative. I don't want to be around you, you bash other people. And that's it. And it doesn't mean you have to say, oh, I, I agree with their Ashtavos, but just don't go negative. There was on Purim, and this, this fellow in Shulman, he was, he was, um, coming over to me, a very smart guy, and he was saying, yeah, I can't stand this Hasidim. And you know, so I like stop and I said, do you realize how negative you are? You're like a negative person. I can't be around you. Negative. So, yes. What should you have said to her? So like, how would you explain that, that situation? Instead of calling him a fool, what would you say? I, I would have said, I, I could have said very nicely, oh, which is a wonderful class, and you're doing it for credits, and I love your enthusiasm. I have a little bit of reservation because I'm not sure you're going to get what you want out of that class. And, uh, you know, it could be that I can set up a class for you and get credits for it, but you could then take a different subject and meanwhile you learn more. There was a, today, it would be easy for me. But then it was very difficult. And even today, I find it difficult. Sometimes, like, let's just urge go negative, let's speak about reform, let's speak about, consult, let's speak about what they did to the Jewish people. Oh, why? Why? No one knows doing anything on purpose these days. We just don't know. Don't go negative. And if you are positive, if you're a person who can emanate love, and people look at you and they see somebody who genuinely loves every year, no matter who you are, no matter what you are, the world is your oyster. People will cling to you and they won't let go. I can't stress it enough. I, the, the vision in my mind, I know our, our talk is over, the vision in my mind, I have a I'll finish with this. I have a grandfather who was lifted a year and a half ago. And he was a metzias. He was a walking shtick love. And by the way, men are not comfortable saying the L-O-V-E. Except for <laughs> sports and beer. 
But, <laughs> Oh, Carl also for sure. I love that Carl. I love Carl. But, but you could be a Matthias of love. My grandfather was a Yaki who lived in Kiryat Sans, Netanya. And the Hasidim loved him. And they were Mechabit in one series. He spoke for the whole Kleisenberger Kihila. And he would, he would walk down the street. He would say, Shalom Alei. He was the only, he was the only guy in Kiryat Sans who was able to speak to women. And they would speak back. He would say, he would say, Shabbat Shalom, Gidar and Shabbat. And she said, Shabbat Shalom, Arav Eisman. Get Shabbat, Shabbat. You emanate love, people want to be around you. And if you can genuinely love each and every year, oh, no matter if you think they're, if you think they're firmer than them, if they think they're firmer than you, they are not as firm as you, they, they're different than you, they're spider, they're Ashkenazi, they, whatever it is, if you can emanate it, you give Hashem the biggest Nachas Ruach. And that's why it says in Chazal, Mi sheruach habriyas noicha emmanu, ruach hamakam noicha emmanu. If other people enjoy your company, other people get pleasure from you, no matter who you are, no matter which averis you've done, if other people enjoy your company, ruach hamakam noicha emmanu. Hashem is going to love you. He'll still want you to do tshuva for those averis, but Hashem will love you. Thank you very much.